Good evening. I'm Chris Brown, the interim director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. The GE Aviation Lecture Series is the museum's longest running sponsored program. We've hosted more than 150 lectures since 1982, with speakers ranging from legends like Chuck Yeager and Bob Hoover to pilots pushing the modern aviation envelope, like Thunderbird pilot Nicole Malakowski and Boeing test pilot Susanna Darcy Hanneman. Thanks to the support from GE Aviation, we have been able to provide access to these programs free of charge, both for those attending in person and more recently for audiences all over the world listening via our live webcast and social media. GE Aviation's long-standing support is a perfect example of the kind of partnership that is critical to our mission here at the museum. Their support comes in many forms, including our highly successful Explainers program. Explainers are high school and college students who lead educational demonstrations and programs throughout the museum. In fact, one of our high school explainers was recently accepted by all eight Ivy League universities. She's an excellent example of the skills and talent that the Explainers program has helped foster. With help from our partners like GE Aviation, we will continue to inspire new generations of visitors for decades to come. And this support will be more important than ever as we embark on a monumental effort to rebuild and transform our home here on the National Mall. Please join me in recognizing and thanking our GE sponsors for supporting this museum and its guests in so many ways. Tonight's speakers represent that rare place where technology and personal courage intersect in ways that extend our frontier and set new world records. John Sharp was formerly a composite engineer at Lockheed Martin's legendary Skunk Works with an enduring interest in building his own aircraft. In 1990, he and Patricia, a skilled composite fabricator herself, formed an air racing powerhouse named after the signature aircraft they designed, built, and tested together, Nemesis. Nemesis first took flight in 1991 and won 45 out of 48 contests that it entered. It still holds 16 world speed records and has been honored by organizations at home and abroad as the most successful aircraft in the history of air racing. Retired from air racing in 1999, Nemesis now enjoys a place of honor at our Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. Never once to rest on their laurels, John and Patricia immediately set to work on a new aircraft, Nemesis NXT, which dominated the 2009 National Championship Air Races, where it won, literally, a record a day and two on Sunday. Within the next several days, Nemesis NXT will land at Dulles, celebrating its final flight before entering the National Collection at the Udvarhazy Center. It will briefly rest among some of the world's most iconic aircraft in our Mary Baker Engen restoration hangar before being put on public display alongside its older sibling, Nemesis. And in a few years, Nemesis NXT will join other milestones of air racing in our upcoming Nation of Speed exhibit, among the first of our newly transformed galleries. It is now my pleasure to introduce the first couple of competitive air racing, John and Patricia Sharp. Well done, thank you. Well, Chris, that was awesome. Uh, we're done now, thanks. <laughs> so, um, first of all, 
You have to know air racing is an audience participation sport, okay? <clears throat> you guys have to be part of this. So what we do is we take questions, and the way to get your question, make sure it gets answered, is write it on a 20, oh wait, we're in Virginia and DC. Write it on a $50 bill, <laughs> <laughs> give it to her, and she'll make sure your question gets answered. So, and uh, we want to thank uh, you all for coming and uh, on the internet watching uh, all of our nemonoids out there, wherever you are, uh, Italy, all over the place. Uh, thank you for your help and everything you've done. We couldn't be here without you. <clears throat> Before we get in uh, too far, I want to bring a couple people up uh, to the stage here. First of all, a um, gentleman that went with uh, me to my very first air race in Mexicali, Mexico in 1976, our crew chief, chief engineer, best friend, and everything to us, Mr. Steve Hill. <clears throat> So Steve, as his uh, final uh, Nemesis NXT uh, thing, he is uh, riding right seat in the NXT uh, that flew it from Moriarty, New Mexico, and they got 90% here, 90%. They had to stop in uh, Clarksburg, West Virginia. Does anybody here work for the FAA? <laughs> yes? We need to talk. <laughs> Bad. The plane can't get here because of some paperwork things. So then the uh, next person I want to bring up is uh, Steve Hill's wife, uh, Lily, who is uh, what we call our Deputy Director of Marketing and <laughs> Sales. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Lily uh, helps Patricia with all the things that we have to do to make our Cast of Thousands team work. And then the last person I want to bring up here is the gentleman who's flying the NXT in my place uh, to get it from Moriarty, New Mexico to its new home out here. Justin, please come up. Justin Phillipson. <clears throat> so Justin, I have a little thing. Uh, you know, the NXT, how you travel with the NXT is you take your wallet and credit cards because there's no room for anything. So I know you have an NXT shirt, but you had to leave it at home. So we brought one, we brought one for you. Now you can wear it back on the airlines. So. And the first we have to give our Yeah, so okay, so. <laughs> we're not worthy of all you. Thank you so much. Thank we appreciate you all so your much. help. Steve, my buddy, thank you. Thank you. There, now we match. Justin. Yep. <clears throat> okay, thank you guys. Now get out. <laughs> so, okay, so um, I'm going to turn this over to my wonderful wife, Patricia, who's my partner in everything, which I would not be anywhere without her uh, with airplanes in life or anything. And so I think she's got a bunch of pictures that will be going on. And... Uh, I'll turn it over to her. Okay, this is kind of scary because usually I'm not the one talking. I'm always the one in the background making things happen. Costumes <laughs> all around. But at any rate, since I'm here, I'm going to tell you my side of the story. So I'm going to start out with how John and I met. So I was living in Austin, Texas at the time, and I was learning to fly in San Marcos, <coughs> a little town just outside of Austin. And after I'd land, I'd always like to walk around the hangars and meet people and talk with people. And I met this guy one day, Cecil, nicest guy in the world. Got to talking with him. And I saw in his hangar on over to, kind of to the left, a little tiny plane. And I said, oh, that thing is cute. And I asked if it was his. He said, no, it's my hangar's mate. And it's a cassette. It's a kit built. And he races it. Three things. I'm going, huh? I don't get it. So at any rate, <coughs> hey, go four weeks forward. The company I was working for sent me off to L.A. for a business meeting. So I was leaving Austin, stay over, uh, 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 stay over in Phoenix, and then on to L.A. <coughs> so got on in Austin with my little book, <coughs> took my seat, sat down and read. Got off at Phoenix, <coughs> went straight to the gift shop because I wanted to get a card for my sister. So I'm looking at the cards, and I just happened to look up 
and John was walking by, and we had eye contact. <laughs> we smiled at each other. My little heart spun Peter Patter. <laughs> he was handsome. So I get back on the plane, and I am sitting actually right behind him. So I walk past him and get into my seat, and he goes, is L.A. your home? And I said, no, I live in Austin. And he goes, oh, I live in San Marcos. And I said, oh, I'm learning to fly there. And uh, he goes, oh, I fly there too. And I said, well, you might know this guy I just met. His name is Cecil, and there's this <coughs> cutest little plane in his hangar. And John pulls out his wallet, shows the picture at me, and says, is this it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So by this time, the lady next to him turns to me and goes, do you want us just trade seats? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Couldn't get her out of there fast enough. <clears throat> Anywho, so John and I are sitting next to each other, and we talked the whole time from Phoenix on to L.A., traded business cards. Eventually, I get back to Austin, and in my office was a dozen roses. Yeah, I'm still looking for the guy who sent those. <laughs> Might have been Cecil. <laughs> it was him. <laughs> so we date for two years, and we get married. And uh, our, our wedding day, I said, oh, John, I love you so much. I will follow you to the ends of the earth. And he took me there <laughs> <coughs> for 20 years. <laughs> if you've never been to Lancaster, California, don't. <laughs> And if you have, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it is an ugly place. But it was a blessing in our life because we got a chance to build two planes. So the first plane, Nemesis, I didn't know, I had no idea what the composites were. And so I didn't have anything to do with building that plane. Although my strengths, I felt, was writing the press releases and setting up proposals and attracting the sponsors to help us play, <laughs> basically. And uh, I also did this with another teammate to make it a little bit easier, Dan Bond. So um, my other thing I wanted to do, because I realized how important our team was, and kind of give you an idea, we had a team of 15 to 25 people, depending on which event we went to. So, uh, and John has this ability to gather the most talented people in the world. So each person had a talent that helped us be as successful as we've been. Without them, we couldn't do it, and I can't stress that enough. So what I wanted to do was to make sure that all the team members are very well taken care of. I had this plan. <laughs> I make sure that they had credentials to get into the air races, their team t-shirts, um, hotel reservations, food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, of course, right by the plane. Uh, so they could focus on John and the race plane to make sure everything's safe. I did the same thing with the NXT, the next plane that we built. But I changed, I added a little more. And that's when I started becoming a composite fabricator. Had no idea what composites were, had no idea what I was gonna be doing, but I was gonna do it. <laughs> so um, John has already decided the type of fabric that we're gonna be working on it with. And it's a carbon fiber and you go to the manufacturer and you say, okay, I want this weave, I want this thickness, and will you please marry it with this epoxy resin? And so they put them all together and it comes in a roll. And it comes in a roll about, a uh, large roll, about 200 pounds, and frozen. And the reason why it's frozen is epoxy has, for lack of a better word, a shelf life out in the ambient temperature. So um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but just kind of let you know where that goes. <coughs> So in 2000, we've already retired Nemesis. So um, I, was, I thought, okay, I'll write a press release. And so I went to the sport class website because that's where we were gonna go to. That's the, the new race class where we're gonna enter. And uh, my press release was, we're retiring Nemesis, we're getting out of Formula One racing, and we're gonna go into the new uh, class of racing sport class. So I went to their website. At the time when I wrote this press release, the requirements were <coughs> it had to be an experimental aircraft, and it had uh, engine requirements for it. So you know you can too large an engine going on. So uh, sent the press release out, and about two weeks later, I'm back out the hangar, of course, 
<coughs> and I thought, well, I gotta go back onto the website just to see, you know, learn about this pilots and just kind of learn a little bit more about this new race class. And I clicked on the rules uh, page, and and uh, huh, they changed the rules. It's called goalpost moving. Uh -huh. <laughs> <coughs> so the new rule was now. If you're building a new kit aircraft, you had to have five now. One could be yours, that you had to have be, been in the build process, et cetera, before you race. So that was in 2000. Uh, I, call, I, I was devastated. Called John Crine at Lockheed, when he's at Lockheed, and said, we're in the kit business. It, it's more than that. She called up and I could barely understand her. We're in the kit business now. <laughs> What, what, what? Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. So true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they threw down the gauntlet and we're stupid enough to pick it up. So we did it. So between 2000 and 2003, which is a total blur, and I am learning new things about composites I thought I never would ever learn. And uh, since we had to build five kits, we need to now walk in freezer. And when I say we, there's always team members around us to help us make this happen. So we found a hotel that was closing down and they had a walk-in freezer that they basically sold to us dirt cheap. But we had to disassemble it there and then take it back to the hangar and reassemble it. So we did that. The next thing we needed was a, a oven to cure our parts. Now our fuselage is 24 feet long as are as our wings. So we got a land sea container and made an oven out of that. And Richard Bott is around here somewhere. I don't know where he is. But he was one of our team and, members. And Steve. And Steve, yeah. Oh, that's Steve, were you? Oh, yeah, you were. Help making this the oven and making the controller and everything like that. Why I sat back there and looked pretty. <laughs> but <laughs> so it's my brain. Um, so our, we had this oven with a controller attached to it. And the controller allowed the oven to ramp up to a particular temperature. For this resin, we needed 250 and ramp back down to cure the part. And it took eight hours, eight and a half hours really, to cure the part. So now we have the walk-in freezer, we have the oven, and at this point we knew that we had 44 molds to make to make the plane. So I'm out there Monday through Thursday by myself with my cat. She was also a team member. She was one, our little mouser. And so, and she was just like a little puppy dog. You open the hangar door and she'd come running up to you and she was so excited to see you and she wanted to show you her kill. And it was always right underneath the prop of the airplane. <laughs> Hence, Nema Kitty. <coughs> so that's our kitty. So anywho, um, <coughs> so from 2000 to 2003, we get everything set up, and in 2003, I start making parts. Now, I'm not the only person making parts. Steve Hill, our crew chief, helped considerably. Uh, Kevin Lucky, Darren Kimura, our other team members, helped tremendously. Um, I got trained through a lot of other friends of ours, and uh, so I started making parts. And by that time, we also had sold the four other uh, kits. So I start making our, our plane, and then I start get one through, well, one through five. So, um, and still out the hangar by myself, yay. <coughs> but uh, <laughs> actually I loved the, I loved, I loved making parts. I love being a composite <coughs> fabricator. Um, so I decided since I was out there and I've, you know, I'm all by myself and I decided I'm gonna give myself a new fancy title. <laughs> Cause I'm important. <laughs> yeah, right. So I decided to give myself the fancy title of parts department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's just me and Nimi and the parts department. <laughs> so, anyway, so in 2004, well, actually 2003, I'm starting to make parts, and by 2004, our plane starts flying. And uh, so this is gonna be my, my first time to get in the plane was in September on our way to the Reno you know, Air Races. Now, I like to navigate. Yeah forgot about the parts department thing. No, I said the, the parts, yeah, oh, the, the parts the department. Date? No, I haven't oh, done that yet. Oh. Okay, settle down over there, <laughs> goodness sakes. You know, he's used to up here talking, he isn't used to me doing this. 
I love you. I love you. I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, I'm getting to the best part. Okay. <laughs> About me being the navigator. <laughs> yeah. So, I decided I want to be the navigator because that way I can tell John where to go. <laughs> With a smile on my face, of course. <laughs> so we get in our cockpit, and the planes <clears throat> is really low when you're you're taxing, as both Steve and Justin knows, and you can't see out. You just see blue sky. So uh, we, you do a lot of S-turns to, to be able to see. But we had, I had GPS, took a, a stack of GPS here. I had GPS in front of me for weather and traffic. And I had this monitor right here. The monitor was connected to a camera. And the camera's on the wheel pant, or actually the, the, the landing gear. And uh, it, was, it was nice to have it because it gives you kind of a clear idea of what's out there while you're doing S-turns. So this plane takes off fast, lands, or well, flies fast, and lands fast. So we get in there, our, you know, my first flight, we get in and, and uh, <coughs> get everything set, and we take off, the gear comes up, and the monitor goes blank. We have this absolutely beautiful, beautiful flight to the Reno State Airport for the first air race for this plane. We come in for a landing, gear goes down, and all I see is lay ground just whew, right into my face, and it's like a train wreck. You cannot look away. <coughs> it scared me silly, and I think I gasped a little bit. <laughs> gasped. We're, we're coming into Reno for our first landing, and all I hear from over here is, <gasps> <gasps> I'm going, what, 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 what? And she's going, <laughs> she's pointing at the screen. Of course, this camera is on the landing gear, and it's, I don't know, 18 inches off the ground. And so we're coming in at 150 miles an hour, and here comes the ground, and here's this camera this far off. And so, here's the monitor. so this monitor's in front of her, and she just couldn't look away. And so it was like, what? what? What's the noise? What's wrong? What's wrong? So, <coughs> so <laughs> what an experience. <coughs> but I did find out that the monitor has an on off button of which I used all the time after that. So, remember I told you I was the parts department? Okay, so my next story, my last story, actually I might add to this little last story, and it has a date, and it's uh, March 13th, 2007. And I was blessed to be able to give donated kidney to John. But the cool thing was, I was like a perfect match. I mean, absolutely perfect match. Yeah, one of our doctors, uh, kidney docs, actually thought we were from Mississippi or Arkansas. <laughs> Family twig, you know? As we're related, no. <laughs> so I was gonna, we are blessed. So but I was gonna add something to this, because we were kind of had this little conversation when we had dinner tonight. So I love chocolate. I mean, I absolutely love chocolate. So when John and I got married, he, was, he didn't like chocolate, which is fine with me. <laughs> I got to eat it all. <laughs> so we do the kidney transplant, the, the kidney swap, or just a kidney donation. And uh, we're at, back out the hangar. And I have a stash of chocolate in the freezer. Those little chocolate kisses that I put in my little pocket. And I have a ch you know, chocolate so often. Well, I went to the... the freezer and my chocolate stash was diminished Cecil. and who yeah right Cecil keep some in them yeah right <coughs> detective work we have Nemi and John <laughs> guess you know who knew the chocolate DNA is in the kidney <laughs> yep so this last March 13th, we celebrated 11 years of, for, of the kidney uh, donation. We always call it March 13th Happy Kidney Day. Mm -hmm. And earlier this month, we celebrated 29 years of marriage. So, <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. We are blessed. So with that, we're gonna show just a short video, and then uh, I'll let John talk. Thank you. I guess you don't need that, do you? Cue the video.
John Sharp and his wife Patricia are champions of the fastest and most dangerous motorsport in the world. It was his race. He was so far out in front. It's eight people going for one spot, just like car racing. But you have the vertical element where you can actually fly up over someone. As far as the, the danger goes, it's, it's just fun to race and you try to mitigate all the risk and I don't really think too much about it. I do worry, it's, uh, it's a dangerous sport and I do forget to breathe. Pilots race around a course of telephone poles or pylons at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour, as low as 70 feet from the ground. Accidents happen quickly and many racers have been killed. John's retired racer, Nemesis, is on permanent display at the National Air and Space Museum. It is the most successful plane in the history of air racing. We had such a great team. It was a very close-knit family. Back home in Southern California, they're building a new airplane, the Nemesis NXT, to compete in the faster sport class of air racing. Tricia and I are just really, really excited about this. and She's made all these parts, and that's probably the proudest part to me. Our purpose is to see what we can do and you know what, what we can produce. The NXT is being made almost entirely from carbon graphite composites. There is no metal skeleton inside this airplane. The NXT will be the newest and most advanced air racer in the sport. It's, it's brand new. Nothing like this has ever flown before and so that is a legit question. Will it fly? First flights are always scary. It's first time in the airplane. Well, I think we're all equally petrified, yeah. Switch is on. Clear. I hate to say you cross your fingers and push in the throttle and hope for the best, but that's really kind of what you do. <laughs> John reaches almost 180 miles an hour before he attempts to lift off. Once in the air, John keeps the landing gear down and stays within gliding range of the runway in case anything goes wrong. This whole thing, you know, it starts as a dream. It's just a, a dream out there in your head. John and Trisha have worked for over three years to achieve this first flight, and now they have just six weeks for the NXT's first race. Hundred thousand fans attend the national championship air races held every year in Reno, Nevada since 1964. Race classes range from home built kits to supercharged World War II fighters. This is the fastest motorsport in the world. These airplanes can be pushing 500 miles an hour in close proximity to each other as well as the ground. The thing was made to race. We're out here to, to fly it fast and race it and be as safe as we can, but that's what we're here for. If you call for going on the clock, as they say, at Pylon 4, then they'll start timing you. They'll ask you if you want one or two laps and tell them what you want, and they'll time you. They'll tell you qualified. Then you can kind of relax until the real racing starts. You get to qualify one time. We just want to get out and get a good time and get on to the next step. You are clear for takeoff with 3208. As John takes off to qualify, this will only be his second time flying his new and much faster airplane on Reno's tight course. John continues to build up speed as he races along less than 100 feet off the desert floor. Using only a fraction of the NXT's horsepower, John makes a qualifying lap at 325 miles an hour. Qu 
We're qualified. John's clear to land. There he is. Oh, come on, John. And, and he lost the gear. Oh, gear's down. Oh, one gear's down. Oh, no. I left her urge caution. No sooner than I touched down, there's a really loud bang from the left side and the left wing dipped down and I, I knew I was in trouble right there. He did such a good job of keeping that thing on the runway as long as he did and it only went 10 feet off the runway. It's uh, credit to his flying skills. A lot of a dream went skidding down the runway and you know, as I look out there and I see it sitting there, I just, it's not where it belongs. It belongs sitting on its wheels. Trisha, she's obviously panic big time and I wanted so badly to get to her and say plane's broke but I'm okay. Let's see what where we go from here. Let's beat your speed kill along the way we'll take our spills always risk and move fast. Sonic boom is such a plan. Hard faster is how we play it gets a little harder every day. So slick should be a blur. Harder faster call the stir. Oh. oh, there we are. So that's a big emotional moment for us. And Steve, it's still uh, still big for us. But uh, we recovered from that and made it uh, made it further. So um, now you've ha heard the fun stuff. So now we'll get into some of the boring technical stuff. And hopefully there won't be any insomnia. This is our little Formula One nemesis that's in the Udvarhazi facility right now. It's in the uh, prominent place that they, uh, they parked it and then they pulled up this other plane next to it, the Enola Gay or something. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they wanted to stage that Enola Gay near the, the draw. So you, you look at this plane and you see all these decals all over it, you know? <clears throat> and we worked so hard to make the airplane so smooth, so clean, to go fast, no drag, all that. And then someone says, well, then you put all these decals on it. Doesn't that slow it down? The answer to that is without the decals, it doesn't go at all. So, <laughs> so uh, that's Patricia's uh, decal work. One thing I want to pass on to you there, uh, that's just off the runway at Reno. You can see how small this plane is. It's like this tall and it's this wide. So on the front of that prop is a, a carbon fiber propeller. All carbon fiber created, engineered, designed, developed, and made by that man right there, Steve Hill. The uh, carbon fiber props are, are amazing things. The reason um, Steve started on this carbon fiber prop thing was the previous race propellers were all aluminum. And aluminum vibrates, tunes up vibration, and they have this ungraceful failure mode where they throw a prop blade off, gone. So this prop weighs like 35 pounds, so you throw off you know, 10, 15 pounds, the engine shakes, the engine falls out of the motor mounts, it breaks motor mounts, people get hurt. Steve took the task to build a safe, safe performance race prop that went faster than the aluminum props that we were running of the day. And you made what, over 200 of them, something like that? 200 over 20 years? 28 years? Whoa, 28 years, 200 props. And he, he single-handedly probably saved a dozen lives in Formula One racing because this was a very, very dangerous thing and a very ungraceful failure mode. So anyway, so that's our little, our little beastie there. We call it the Formula One world beater because it did beat everybody every time it went. So on to the next one here. Let me see if I can make my little clicker go. Okay, clicker. Let's try that. Now we're going. Okay, here we go. Oops. Could you restart that, please? We'll get this figured out. Techni okay, here we go. Okay, on to the next one. Good. Okay, we got it. So, results. Nemesis results. The plane was incredibly successful. And I wanted to correct Chris one on one little thing. 
The airplane won 47 of 50 races, not what he had. So, uh, so yes, we did lose three races with that plane. The very first one was the very first race it was in, our first trip to Reno. I'm out there flying around. I was in third place. I was catching up to the guys who were in the lead. And this is like a whole new thing for us. You know, we're, we're starting to eat people alive. I go around the turn and I hear this noise in the plane that I'd never heard before <clears throat> since this is our first time running all this with Steve's brand new race prop. Hear this noise, scares the tar out of the pilot. So I pull up and I land. And that made us a DNF so we didn't finish. So we didn't win that race. So that day, all of our team was walking around the airplane. They're banging on stuff and hitting stuff trying to find this noise, you know, the noise that scares the pilot. And someone hit this thing on the plane. I went, that's it, from across the hangar. That's it, that's it. Well, it turns out it was a little bracket that held the instrument panel steady. And it was just a little piece of bent up metal and it would vibrate up against the canopy and make this noise. So we had to fix that. We took a high technology fix on that. We wrapped a popsicle stick around it with tape. <laughs> made it not vibrate anymore, pilot happy. <laughs> so the next, uh, the second loss was the next day where we put, uh, because the pilot was all nervous after the first day and the new noise, we put on our very uh, favorite test propeller that, again, Steve made, and we flew around, came in second in that race, because I was just scared, I didn't want to hear any more noises. So that was our second one. The third one was in our last year, in 2009, when we knew this was gonna be our last year of racing Formula One. So we put on our fourth or fifth, two, oh, I'm sorry, 2000, 2000, oh, 1999. Boy, time flies. Anyway, 1999, we put on our fourth best setup, prop, engine setup, exhaust setup, all these things, detuned the airplane so the pilot boy wouldn't break the engine. So I came in second in that race because I was out loafing around, flying nice and easy. I thought I'd found a new line to make the plane go fast. So we're counting down the laps and Instead of being ahead at the end of the third lap, we're going into lap number six, and I'm looking out there at the guy that's leading. I'm going, what's going on here? So I tighten the plane all up and get in real close to the pylons, and I'm catching up, catching up, catching up, and I almost got there, and I cut a pylon, so that put me at the back of that field. So that was the third, third loss in 1999, our last year. All the rest of them were wins, every one of them. So. So here's our little baby out on the start line at Reno. The Formula One, they race eight airplanes at a time, and the races start from the ground. So there's a guy, let's see if I can find this. I don't know if you can see this. There's a guy in a pickup, oops. Pilot education training coming up. Okay, I'll see if I can do this. There's a guy right up there in that pickup truck, right up there, I'll show you on this one. Right up there. And he's standing in the back of that pickup with a flag. And there's eight angry Hornet airplanes ready to take off. And that guy's the craziest of all of us because there's eight little bees heading right towards him. But anyway, so here's Steve Hill are sitting on our tail there and Patricia over there to the right, one of our other crew members up there, uh, making sure the spinner's on straight for us. This plane was amazing. It won a lot of amazing awards. The first of which is the Blerio Medal. Now, Blair, the Blerio Medal is from Louis, Louis Blerio, a Frenchman, that was the first to fly across the English Channel in an airplane. He also won the very first air race ever. So the National Aeronautic Association here in Washington and the FAI, Federation Aeronautique Internationale, the world uh, record keepers, created this Blerio Medal. The Blerio Medal is only given a maximum of three times per year. One for a speed event, speed record, one for a distance record, and one for an altitude. They didn't give it every year. They didn't give three every year. Sometimes they gave none. To give you the magnitude of this Blerio Medal to our team, Dick Rutan, Gina Yeager with the Voyager flew around the world. They got a Blerio Medal. So we got three of them with this plane. So it's an amazing thing. The next one is the Pulitzer Aviation Trophy. 
Now we just saw this trophy up here upstairs. So this is a trophy for aviation that was created by the Pulitzer family that does the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. We're going, okay, nice. We get this phone call. You guys have won the Pulitzer Aviation Trophy. We go, really? And they go, yeah. We go, well, wow, Pulitzer Prize for Literature. Gets a million dollars. <laughs> She's going, ooh, no more sponsors required. <laughs> so anyway, well, it turns out the Pulitzer Aviation Trophy doesn't get a million dollars. You get lunch. <laughs> we got four of them. <laughs> and then the last one, the Ben Rich Memorial Award. Ben Rich is a, uh, one of the original Lockheed skunks and just a skunk he was. Uh, he was a program manager of the F-117 uh, fighter and wonderful guy. Anyway, the Ben Rich Memorial Award was given by Lockheed to somebody, some people, some program that exemplified Lockheed's Skunk Works philosophy. And that was our uh, little Formula One plane. So that was a, a really cool honor. We don't know how many times that's been awarded over time, but we're excited to have that. So on to the pink beast, as we call it. Um, you'll notice the uh, pink front end of this plane. Of course, every real air racer that's a man flies a pink airplane. <coughs> I wouldn't be on to tell you who picked the colors, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we, um, after our first, uh, our, what we called our last landing in 2004 at Reno, our slide job, as you saw in there, when the plane was all white, we wanted to dress the plane up a little bit, <coughs> and one of our teammates, Mirko Piccarari in Italy, said, well, why don't you make it look like the GB racer? go, yeah, let's do that. So that's a tribute to the GB racer paint job there, and uh, the plane looks like that today, the one that uh, Justin and Steve has spent the last two days flying in, trying to get into Dulles Airport here. So this is on takeoff at Reno, and I can tell it's on takeoff because if you look at that rudder deflection right up there, you'll see that thing sticking way out to the right because <coughs> that I it's a beast of an engine on there and it takes like all the right foot you can put into it and some you can't. Am I wrong? <laughs> it, it takes a lot. <clears throat> anyway, so, so that's on takeoff at Reno. So performance, here everybody wants to know how fast does this plane go? You know, you're selling kits, you have to sell kits. How fast does it go? Speed, that's the big one. Breathtaking. <laughs> <coughs> it is. And we designed this plane to go faster than your friends, be it around the Reno Rare Race Course, cross country, or especially the, our favorite, from one end of the runway to the other, faster than your friends. So one of the next parameters everybody wants to know is landing speed. How, how fast does it land? And I think Justin can tell you that it lands pretty darn fast. And so that performance is also breathtaking. <laughs> Takeoff distance, that's another parameter for performance on an airplane. You got it, breathtaking again. <laughs> so, and one more, uh, landing distance. You know, you wanna know how long the runway has to be to get your plane in there. So, that landing distance is breathtaking also. So, one more that's a parameter, climb rate. You know, we didn't design this plane to climb. We wanted to, it to climb 50 feet, pylon height at Reno, and that's all the higher we cared. So, didn't have too much of a climb rate, so. Not so breathtaking. Actually, the plane probably climbs about 3,000 feet a minute or so, which is kind of loafing along, so it actually does a pretty good job of that. How many of you all been to the Reno Air Races? All right, okay, good deal. And you let us in anyway. So. Anyway, so we like to show a lot of pictures of the plane. Here's uh, Patricia and I, uh, we went out to Oshkosh to the uh, EAA Air Venture uh, show uh, some years ago. And we were out, uh, we wanted to go out and do a photo shoot with the EAA people. So here we are out flying over Lake Winnebago in, in Oshkosh. And yeah, I don't know, you can't really see so much, but Patricia's little sm smiling face is in there and I'm in there and we're taking off and heading back to California. We've been flying around with this camera plane for, I don't know, about 45 minutes. And this guy, he's been hanging out of the side of a Cessna like this, taking these pictures, and we're just flying with him, you know, wherever they go, and we're flying with him. 
And so they said, okay, we're done. You can leave. And we go, where the H-E double toothpick are we? We have no idea. Could you point us kind of west? So they steered around and pointed us kind of west, and off we went. So, so NXT results were truly astounding. Um, it's a very good airplane, very successful. Not as as uh, quite as successful as the Formula One Nemesis, only because we didn't race it as long. But uh, we'll, we'll start out here, and what I kind of want you to watch is the speeds that will be coming up here and the evolution of the speed of the airplane. So in 2006, we won our first sport class or super sport class national championship at Reno. At the time, there was a sport class and a super sport class. So the super sport guys were the hot rods. You know, they put anti-detonation injection in, and Viagra, you know, race fuel, whatever kind. And actually, we raced this on 100 octane, 100 160 octane racing fuel. So anyway, so we won our first championship in 2006, and that was uh, uh, 2007. We came back and did the same thing again, again in super sport. And we'll talk about this a little bit more if anybody's still awake. <coughs> so 2007, we set a qualifying record, <coughs> 386 miles an hour. I think the previous one was in the 360s, something like that. So it was a big day for us. We had a heat race record of 384. You go, okay, yeah, speeds are going up, sure. Now you drop down. So qualifying, you're out there all by yourself. You fly two laps, fly the best, absolute, perfect line you can with no other people around you. It's just you and the course. When you're in a race, you have seven other more, I mean, guys out there flying, <coughs> some girls too, and uh, you're out there flying, so you got to, dodge around them and go inside and outside and above. So you don't get to fly the optimum course. Qualifying is your best lap of two. Racing a race, they average six laps or eight laps of speed. So those speeds naturally drop down some. So then again in 2007, we had a gold race record. So here we go with the speeds going up. Back up to 385, starting to creep up. Then 2008, Oh, we have another picture here. Sorry, we like to look at pictures of this thing. So this was a taken by a very good friend of ours, Mark Johnson, who was a photographer at Reno for years and years and years. He's standing on the ground taking this picture. It's like wingtip hair part. <coughs> and so this is the bank angle of the plane going 400 plus miles an hour. And uh, so... Reno, you have to have your eyeballs above what they call the pylons and the home pylon, all that stuff. So I was right down there, you know, at hair parting level. So didn't get in trouble for that. But that's a cool picture of the plane. And if anybody's interested in any of the techie stuff, great. And if not, you can take a nap. So um, a couple things on the plane here I want to show you. This little, these little holes right here, those are the inlets right there. Now for you guys over here, there I had to find my pointer. We need our cat around here. but So there's two little inlets up there and that s sends air to the cylinders to keep them cool. So then down below here we have this big massive hole right here, right there. And that is uh, the um, air inlet for the turbochargers. So there's this big hole. The tubes bifurcate, that's my special word of the day, bifurcate, splits off and goes to the two turbochargers. This plane has two turbochargers and two intercoolers to keep the uh, air charge cool with the intercoolers. And then the one last one down below, right down there, right down there, not shaking hardly at all, um, that's the oil cooler inlet. We have an oil cooler down there. The air comes in that inlet at 400 plus miles an hour. We diverge all the sides to slow that air down to about 180 miles an hour, get it to go through the oil cooler at a high pressure and low velocity. And then right on the other side of that oil cooler, we shrink everything down and get the air back up to the exit speed. So if you can bring cooling air in at 400 miles an hour and exit it at 400 miles an hour, you have no cooling drag, none. And that's a huge, huge thing because Drag is, uh, is the enemy in air race planes. So this plane had no drag in the cooling system at all. 
So this was something that we were really, really, really proud of. So anyway, so there's the hair parting shot. So we'll get on to the 2008 results and we'll go through these. We set a new qualifying record. Four freaking 109 miles an hour. This was eye popping, hair standing. You should have seen me in there flying this thing. Anyway, this was uh, the first time that a home built airplane in the sport class or any home built airplane had broken 400 miles an hour at Reno Air Races. It's a huge day for us. So this course that we raced this on at this time was like an egg-shaped course. It's about six miles long. So after, it's kind of just pretty much round. So you're in a turn the whole time like this. You know, your cheeks are down around your kneecaps, you know, stuff like that. <coughs> and so after I landed, the sport class guys came up and said, wow, 409. I go, wow, that's amazing. The Reno Air Race Association comes up, Wow, 409, that's amazing. Any of you guys work for the FAA? <laughs> FAA guy comes up and goes, son, you're going too fast. <laughs> so it was that single lap that moved the uh, sport class, super sport guys, the fast guys, out onto the largest course at Reno, the nine mile course that the unlimited P-51s and jets fly on. So now we're, speeds A to B against P-51s, Bearcats, Sea Furies, Jets, you know, all those things. So uh, we, well, I think in 2009, we were the 17th fastest plane on the airport, including all the Jets and the P-51s, and we would have qualified, I think, at number nine in the unlimited class with the P-51s and Bearcats and stuff. So it's a beast of a plane. <laughs> so there's the Reno start finish line that we call the home pylon there. And uh, we're uh, obviously taking off because that rudder's banged over there to the right again. And if you look on the top left side of the Reno home pylon, you'll see a little black line right there, right at the top of the R. And for you guys over here, right there, right above that R. So you have to keep your eyeballs above that all the time you're racing. If you drop below that, you get low flying and you're sent home. So anyway, so that's an important thing. So as you're tearing around the number seven and eight pylon on the big course going 400 and who knows how many, and you're looking out like this and you're looking to find that black line and that R in Reno because if you're below that, there's guys out there on the contest committee like him, Steve, on the contest committee goes, you're out of here, little mister. So anyway, so that's a, an important thing there. <clears throat> All the results of 2008, so big, big year for us. We'll just get through them here. So look at the speeds, 409 miles an hour on the small race course. Our first heat race, 392, 93. Then our championship race, 392. Now this is like a step for mankind. This is not Neil Armstrong, but in our world it is. So in that year, we won our 14th gold racing, uh, Reno National Championship with a record of 14. Got another picture. So, and we'll get on to some more numbers. So here, here's our plane taxiing in from a race. And I have to tell a little story here about Patricia. Uh, here in, in our little tow vehicles, that white thing over there. She was in a head-on wreck in our Suburban, or as one of our friends calls it, a Chevy subdivision. <laughs> <coughs> she was in a head-on wreck, <coughs> destroyed the car. She was okay. She had to have braces after it. So she said, you know, I want a bigger car now. She wants a tank, she wants a Abrams, you know, she wants to crush people. So anyway, so the, the biggest thing we could find was a Hummer. You know, big things, you know, two miles a gallon, you know. And uh, so anyway, so we talked about it and looking at the prices of Hummers. And then she w happened to see this on the internet of a golf cart that's a Hummer. Ka-ching. Here's her Hummer. So anyway, so that's her Hummer that we pulled our plane around all over the airport with. And, and so anyway, so we'll go back on to the, uh, to the uh, boring numbers here. So 
Five new records in 2008, that 409 amazing number, and we kept going all the way through and getting our 14th championship. And then there's one right down there at the bottom that's just sitting there looking kind of gnarly. What's that 356 thing? Well, we set up to do a speed record at Oshkosh, uh, EAA fly-in, and that place is known for its turbulence, big time. You go tearing down the runway fast and you're doing alternating, hitting the canopy, slamming in the floor, hitting the canopy, slamming in the floor, back and forth like this. So anyway, so we've set out to set a record there at Oshkosh in front of people. Pretty sad number, 356 after the stuff you've seen, but that was our 2008. So we go on to the 2009 hair races. It's our last year of racing. We didn't know it at the time, but we kind of had an inkling. She, she and I had been kind of talking about it a little bit. So we did six records in five days. So there's our, our little plane on its tow dolly, and you'd see our Hummer, and you'll see on the back is a couple of our crew people. Patricia's driving the Hummer, and the pilot gets to hold the umbrella because <laughs> You got to keep the pilot cool, right? <laughs> so anyway, so they always took su such good care of me. And so there I am with my red line oil um, umbrella being cool. So what we call a record in day and two on Sunday, our last year in 2009, we set a new qualifying record of 412 miles an hour on this big course. And this was the, the lap that put us uh, number 17 in the speed charts on the field, including all the jets and everything. And I think we were number eight or nine in the unlimited class. So that was a big, big number. So here we go with speeds again. 393 for a heat race. Okay, kind of slow, but it still was a record. So the next day we went out, took it up to 399. I landed. The crew read me the friggin' riot act going 399 what's up you couldn't gone just a little faster and given us a 400 come on dude you're the pilot boy you carry the umbrella yeah so anyway so 399 so the next day here we go ka-ching 406 so that was a great day for us there and that was uh, our last heat race record coming up to our championship and um, i think it i don't remember which uh, it was on the cruise maybe steve or someone else says I'll bet you you can't go faster. <laughs> ka <-ching. laughs> So there we have, 407. So that's, uh, that's five records right there, so we still have one more. So that, day, uh, that championship was our 15th gold championship, the most, rec most wins of anybody at Reno for our planes and our team. And uh, we have a big, big team. Everybody had jobs. We had engine people. We had airframe people. We had Steve as the crew chief. We had our deputy marketing salesperson and everybody on the team. It's an amazing group of people, and we would have not done any of it without them. So one uh, more picture of our plane here. I think we're coming in on landing, and there's one of those infamous Reno pylons right there you'll see. And, and the top of that is 50 feet. It looks like a telephone pole. doesn't look like terribly big here in this picture, but you go stand up there and look. That barrel up there is about eight or 10 feet in diameter. It's just huge. So these guys that are crazier than the pilots, the pylon judges, they're standing underneath that thing like this, watching these planes go by 500 miles an hour, 550 miles an hour, right over their head, just boom. And they're looking for somebody to cut inside that thing. So they have the fun job of, of standing there, but I kind of think they're the, the crazier ones myself. So. After 2009, we kind of weren't sure what to do next. So we uh, started uh, thinking about doing some speed records. And so we uh, did an event called Thunder Over Moriarty. Moriarty, New Mexico is about 40 miles east of Albuquerque. It's the home of our crew chief, Steve Hill and Lily. And they have a wonderful, wonderful facility there that we based out of. And we'll show you some pictures of why we did that. Moriarty is a great place to set records, high altitude, Thin air makes the plane go fast. Engine turbochargers make the engine happy, makes lots of power. It's a great combination. So here we are at the, on the runway at Moriarty, and you can see how flat and nice it is out there. So that's a great place to do record runs. So we, we uh, did, uh, did some records there. So now let's talk about those. So 
The, ra the record categories are maintained and operated and housed by the NAA that I mentioned earlier, National Aeronautic Association here in Washington, and the FAI in Switzerland. They own and, and do all the records, keep all the history. So there's, race, there's categories for these records. And so if you look up there at the top left, you'll see C1B. So the C is a piston-powered, propeller-driven airplane. There's all kinds of different categories, lighter than air, sailplanes, uh, space shuttles, you know, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, so that's the category one is the, uh, uh, let's see, the C is the, let's see if I can get this right. C is the piston driven, propeller driven. Oh wait, no, C is land planes, that's it, I'll get it right yet. C is land planes as opposed to sea planes. One is the category for piston driven and propellers. Then the next thing there is a B. So that B, in this case, is a weight category. So speed records don't care about your engine. They don't care about putting 500 octane race fuel. They don't care about Viagra. They don't care about any of that stuff. You know? So it's just purely about the weight. So you see that 1,102 pounds to 2,205 pounds. You have to fly the record that you're attempting within that window. So you have to take off at less than 2205, and you have to land at over 1,102 pounds. So if you bust either of those, record's no good. So then the second category is a heavier one, C1C. In our plane, we could put our anti-detonation injection system in and all of our other gee whizzy things and put the plane with more fuel into the heavier category. So you'll see there that there's, it's a lot different weight, 2205 to 3858. We were nowhere near that 3858. So we did three different record distances there. I'll talk about those a little bit if anybody's still awake. We did three kilometer, 15 kilometer, and 100 kilometer. So the three kilometer is the truest form of speed record for an airplane. What that three kilometer is, is it's a, you go through a timing gate that's right here, point A, here's point A right here. Then three kilometers later, there's another timing gate. They're virtual uh, timing gates that are based on uh, differential GPS. So outside of those, one kilometer further out, there's what we call an altitude gate. That altitude gate is one out on this end and one on this end. So now it's a, fi a fi five, mile, five kilometer course that you have to fly in a window that's 200 feet by 200 feet during that whole time. If you bust any of that 200 by 200 foot window in that five kilometers, bing, you're out. Have to try again. So there's one more thing about that is you go out that five kilometer window, you can pull up a little bit, cool down, check everything, and you can come back down in for that next record. Well, there's a defining moment on that too you can't go above basically 1,500 feet on that turnaround. Go 1,501, boom, you're out. That record attempt is void. So I go up to about 1,200 feet, giving the pilot and the altimeter a couple of hundred feet of, of cushion. Turn around, come back in. You had to get down to that 200 foot by 200 foot window for those five kilometers while the timers are all going, all the GPS stuff. So that's the truest, truest definition of what the plane will do because it's not done at, a pro at the ideal altitude like a jet or 20,000 feet, 80,000 feet, whatever. It's on the deck at the place that you pick to do the records. So that's why the three kilometers, the premium one that there is. The next one is a 15 kilometer. It has some requirements too. There's that timing gate again, virtual timing gate. You go out 15 kilometers, which I don't know, is that six miles, something like that? And you go out through this gate out there. So this is a little ways away, you know, six miles away from the airport. It's a long ways in this plane. So the, the course for the 15 kilometer is marked by, on one end, by Joe's hangar down at blah, blah, blah airport. You'll recognize it by the one with the silver roof. <coughs> so go down that way. You'll see Joe's hangar at I don't even remember what the name of the town was now, but which one? Oh, Estancia, that's it. So 
just outside of Moriarty. So if you go blasting off, you go through the start gate at Moriarty, just to the left of the oil tanks and fuel tanks on the ground, say Exxon and Shell on them, stuff like that. So you keep that right off your right wing, and you zing down there to Estancia, down to Joe's hangar. And, and you go out there, you can climb up, cool down, and come back. So now you go right over Joe's hangar and head to the oil tanks in Moriarty. So off you go. So that's an average of two passes out and back. I forgot to mention the three kilometer is the average of four passes. So that three kilometer is four passes, two in each direction in consecutive runs. If you bust any of the parameters, you have to start all over again. Has to be in, in two consecutive runs, or four consecutive runs, all done in 20 minutes from the time you take off to the time you land. So you can't get out there and dilly dally. So the last one, this one turned out to be the most interesting one, the 100 kilometer, and that's like 35, 40 miles out, and we didn't even have the luxury of. Uh, I love you and everything, but you know what? You you gotta kind of hurry it up. Okay, <laughs> okay. Anyway, so we did the 100 kilometer run, and and it was out there at uh, uh, Bob's uh, farm, out there. There's a little shack out there. You go out there, 15 kilometers out, and turn around, come back. So that record is from when you s go through that start gate, you go out there, 20 miles or so, turn around, come back. The clock's running all the time. So anyway, so those are the records uh, that we did. We'll just skip this picture and get on. And so these are the records that we did in those. In those. Uh, you can see 393 for the three kilometer, the old was 385, 405, old 307, 415, old 390. The most amazing one was that 100 kilometer one which was 397 miles an hour average. That one won us another Blario medal, so that was pretty cool. So uh, we're going to do a little a quick video here called For the Record, Chris Webb that made the uh, Air Racer Chasing the Dream that you saw the little trailer for. This is a trailer for a For the Record movie that's coming out. to set six world records with the Nemesis NXT race plane. We're running the airplane so hard, we're literally baking some of the paint off of it. We have always wanted to show the world how fast this airplane can really go. That sound is amazing. Okay, questions? Yes. Uh, we use magnetos because our engine guys like magnetos as opposed to electronic engine controls. Although we did do a development on a Lycoming engine for electric controlled engine, we were the pro did the prototype work on that in that very airplane. So. <laughs> um, the uh, FAA says we did six, so that's how many we did, <laughs> plus uh, three or four more, <laughs> so that's like the chicks down around your kneecaps, so others, yes sir? Well, I don't know much about that because I only like to go fast, but it depends really on how loud you want the engine to be. It's, it's pretty comfortable. It carries 90 gallons of fuel, so it's pretty comfortable to go two hours, two and a half or so, but it really depends on how loud the engine is. But you're going at 380 or 90 miles an hour across country, so you're very far away from where you started each day. <laughs> yes, sir? We, we did. We did yes and yes. We did 
uh, designed the airplane from scratch. It's, it's just out there. Um, the airplane we finally wound up with was n serial number 306M. We started at 300, and we go A, B, C, D, E, F for iterations, and then we switch over to the next number, 301. So we were at 306M, I think, in pencil drawings and computer drawings, and then before we ever went into anything. Yes, we did do a wind tunnel model, and you saw it back there in the little pictures, little black wind tunnel model about this big. So that helped us for control and stability mostly. Okay, we're gonna make some good money tonight. Well, oh, how many? How long would the engine last in Formula One and or sport class before you had to replace it? Formula One, uh, we ran the engine that's in the little Nemesis and it's in that plane right now as we speak. We ran that in our previous plane, Aeromagic, and won two championships with that, starting in 82. So 82 to 99 on that engine. 2004, after our slide job at Reno, they built us a new one, and it, that engine's still in the airplane. Continental for the O200, the little engine in the little world beater was 200 cubic inches, 100 horsepower. That plane weighed 500 pounds, soaking wet. The Nemesis NXT engine weighs 600 pounds. Then you have a 100 pound propeller and a big airframe and all that. Okay, last question. Did, I th did you, I thought you had some. Oh, okay, good, okay, good. One more. Yes, sir, over here. Yes, both airplanes had a modified uh, NASA NLF, laminar flow series airfoil, that we modified. NASA put in millions and millions of dollars and a lot of research to develop these airfoils, and then we modified it. <laughs> we weren't happy. But it was, it was, uh, NASA did a great job, and to this day, some will call up the, the guy who developed the original series, and they go, do you know what Nemesis did to that airfoil? Because I want to do the same thing. Sorry, I don't know what they did to it. You got to call them. So it was modified to reduce the lift, actually, because it was a very high lift series section, but very uh, low drag. So next, I'm going to turn the mic over to him, and I'll stop blabbering. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I know we could go on for, for, many more, for another hour, but one of the things that General Daly said when he retired and I took over on an interim basis is beyond time, and <laughs> I've already violated that. But um, before we close out, um, I think it's important for a little bit of context to understand a bit more about the museum, and that is, we are a, the nation's collection of most iconic and impactful artifacts in aviation and aerospace. There's no other collection like it. And there are a lot of people and objects that like to get into the collection. But it, it doesn't work that way. What we have are subject matter experts, curators, who understand the collection like no other and understand what makes it iconic, what makes it impactful, and why should it be in the nation's collection. And so joining me, I just wanted uh, Jeremy Kenny, who is a, a, a curator of aeronautics with us, who specializes in air racing, to share for a moment, okay, we get it. It's an amazing airplane. Sure. And by all rights, should be in the national collection. But Jeremy is a curator that really ultimately decides what comes into the collection. What's the process? How does this work? We know we've had this unprecedented opportunity to transform our National Mall building. And we came up with this idea of a nation of speed. And this heavy motorsports component in it, and especially air racing. And the first airplane, the first team I thought of was Team Nemesis and NXT. I said, we have to have that. And so it was just, it was a cold call yeah. uh, to uh, John and Patricia and just an email, and, and so we started talking, and it just worked into this wonderful donation, not only of NXT, but also the Team Nemesis collection. I mean, the wind tunnel model for NXT. John's racing helmet, suit, boots, parachute. You know, all the data logs for uh, the original Nemesis. So just documenting this you know, fascinating story of this particular team, 
as well as the story of air racing, which I think we do very well with our collection that dates from Jimmy Doolittle, Roscoe Turner, and John Sharp. So. Well, thank you, and I want you to join me in thanking uh, John and Patricia Sharp and Jeremy and everyone and the team behind these things. They don't just happen, but uh, what an amazing contribution to the national uh, story of, of flying and air racing. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. One, one little thing, one little thing. So on, on the donation of the little plane, we're at Oshkosh, and, and uh, we're talking to a, a, a very wonderful guy from the Smithsonian. General Daly was there, and Don Lopez was there. And Don Lopez was, told us this story about Chuck Yeager wanting to go up and sit in the glamorous Glenis again. And they brought in a man lift, hiked Chuck Yeager up there into his plane, and he sat there with a big smile on his face. He pulled out a magic marker. He signed the instrument panel. And the people went nuts because it wasn't original anymore. <laughs> so we fooled everybody before, right after I got out of the plane at Oshkosh for the last flight, I reached in my pocket, grabbed out my magic marker, signed the instrument panel, hopped out on the wing, signed the papers over, and that was that. So they were happy. It was original. <laughs> so on, on behalf of Nemesis Air Racing, all the cast of thousands all around the world, oh, we hope that you're watching this. and. Thank you so much for having us. We're honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much.